We all set? Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the September meeting. All of our Jet fans are very happy this morning. The Giant fans are not, but we can't have everything. Uh, we'll forget the Yankee fans. Uh, I get it from my wife. That's enough. <laughs> okay. We uh, have one public comment speaker, uh, Ellen Shannon from the PCAC. Ellen? Good morning. My name is Ellen Shannon. I'm the Senior Transportation Planner for the PCAC. And my role at the PCAC is as the Riders Advocate on MTA Capital Projects. Today, PCAC applauds the efforts of the Long Island Railroad and Metro North Railroad to provide riders with data on their delayed and canceled trains. In these operating reports today, we're really happy to see the addition of information on canceled and delayed trains, which impact the riders um, the most every day. And the new website that was, web page that was developed, putting a database on there that puts the information in the hands of riders now to make more informed decisions for which trains they're going to take um, and, and be more efficient in their travels. We'd like to thank Charlie Monheim, Donna Evans, Bob McGlagger, Ray Kenny, Joe Calderoni, and especially the operations departments of both railroads who put the information together in such a cohesive manner. This was over the course of six or seven months, and they've been great to work with, and we really appreciate it. The PCAC is currently finalizing research focusing on the need to develop passenger-based statistics that better convey the impact um, delays have on riders. We regard today as a substantial step. Our, we will be putting out a report with further recommendations next month, and we hope you will stay tuned. So thank you very much for listening to the riders. <laughs> thank you very much for your comments. I do not believe we have any other public speakers. If not, uh, we have the minutes of the July 26th meeting. Motion any to accept. Motion to accept. Any second? Any changes? All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are now going to have a overtime progress update from the two presidents of the railroads. Uh, who's going first? Selena, you going first? I am. Okay. <clears throat> Good morning, and everyone welcome back after the uh, summer break. Uh, we are very pleased to um, start this morning's um, committee meeting with our overtime progress um, update. Uh, as you know, this has been um, a, uh, a very important initiative uh, directly from the chairman of the MTA, Jay Walder. And uh, I am pleased to note that I, uh, Howard and I both come bearing good news on what we've been able to achieve. The MTA expects to reduce overtime spending by $54 million in 2010, exceeding its own stretched um, overtime reduction target. they have been in an earlier target, and then, then we added to it. Uh, as the chairman pledged in the report he issued after his first 100 days on the job, and of course, you know, we're reaching the one-year anniversary of his appointment, um, so it's always a good time uh, to take a moment and assess what have we been able to achieve in that time. Um, the MTA really set out a very aggressive um, uh, program to overla overhaul the way we do business and, of course, make every dollar count. Um, overtime reduction was specifically identified um, as one of our top priorities with a, a real focus on the question, is the overtime necessary? Is it unnecessary overtime? Do we have to have that overtime? Can we do straight time instead? Um, and let me just say, uh, the MTA's initial goal for 2010 was to slash overtime across all agencies by $24 million. In May, we actually added to that reduction target um, of $22 million more. Uh, and that's because as we went through the finance, we looked at our programs, each agency said, what else can we do? Um, and, of course, the chairman was pressing for additional savings as we shape the uh, budget for July. And we're happy to report as we enter the fourth quarter of the year, we are doing better than even that stretched target. 
By year's end, we anticipate overtime savings of $54 million. That's the target. That's 11 percent less than 2009's overtime bill. And at the Long Island Railroad, we are projecting a $13 million drop in overtime in 2010 compared to 2009, a 14 percent reduction. Total overtime hours worked have dropped by 16 percent. Starting from a, a much lower base than Long Island Railroad, Metro North also has achieved a significant overtime savings um, of 3 percent reduction in a year when no savings was expected. And um, Howard will be giving you further details on their program. You know, how was this accomplished, you're going to ask? Uh, it was really a very aggressive effort to reduce unscheduled overtime. And we did use strategic support from the MTA. Uh, they put together a, a very good analytic group that was able to help us further define where we needed to focus our efforts. Uh, and we had begun with an overtime task force actually at the end of 2008. So we had a, a pretty aggressive program of looking at our own internal controls at the beginning of 2009. So we wanted to limit overtime to critical needs by implementing uh, Kronos, uh, the overtime task force, um, closely tracking departments that, ha that are known as our hotspots for overtime. One of the things that Long Island Railroad had to focus on was improved um, employee availability, particularly uh, more controls on the family medical leave program. Our goal was to reduce high earner overtime by 14 percent by banning shifts that exceeded 16 hours um, and monthly reporting on the top 20 overtime earners. We also did, we were able to do some things that helped our, our, our own efforts, um, adjusting starting times, we merged some of our maintenance operations, and most importantly, we've had to focus on keeping headcount right at the level we need um, so that we don't end up uh, replacing absent employees or um, attrition through overtime. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn now to Metro North, who will um, talk about some of their uh, program okay. elements. Yeah, thank you, Helena, and good morning. Um, and, and again, welcome back <clears throat> after the summer. Um, as Helena mentioned, um, the overtime, we have been focusing on overtime very uh, intensively over the past months. In the case of Metro North, uh, this is something, though, that we have been watching and have been managing for a number of years. Um, so we, while we, the, the focus has been more intense, it's really a continuation of an effort that uh, started many years ago. And I think that that is in part shown, we, we do have started a lower base number because of the efforts that had been done over the past years, so a, a smaller number. But saying that, there's still um, places where we believe we can make improvements. Um, as Helena pointed out, we have reduced uh, $3 million dollars. Uh, already in this year, that, that's what our target is, and the vast and the focus of that is on um, unscheduled overtime. Uh, scheduled overtime, which is a big piece of that, uh, is what we put in our train crew books. Was we'll, looked at all the time. It's basically, and it's it's a cheaper way of filling needs than uh, uh, doing uh, adding more people in, in many cases. So our focus on unscheduled overtime, um, and the and the actions we have taken um, are. I think they're up on the slide, yeah. So one is we have put Kronos clocks at all, for timekeeping at all our work uh, locations. That has been completed. Um, we, too, have been looking at uh, certain locations that have high overtime usage to see what can be done in those locations. Um, we also, uh, part of what's been driving overtime in Metro North is number of vacant positions. And so we have expedited our hiring in places where it makes sense that by having uh, the, the positions filled, we don't, we're not filling them on overtime. Uh, we're also looking at business practices that drive overtime, uh, looking at day-to-day um, -day absences. Must they be covered? What happens if they're not covered? Planning and covering uh, for vacancies, looking at scheduled vacations. One of the things we are, we're looking at to, to do more of next year is the uh, smoothing of vacations so that they're not huge bumps in all the departments. Some departments, you, it's, it, that's okay. Other departments, you don't want to do that. Uh, and also looking at how we cover our holidays. Um, so there are a number of different um, elements there we're looking at across the railroad. Um, and finally, we are monitoring the overtime assigned to the top 20 earners and what's causing that and uh, taking a look at that. I think um, going forward, 
um, for both Metro North and Long Island. This is the really the beginning of the process. We will continue to be looking at all these different items. We work very closely with Charlie Monheim and Jules and, and the staff of the MTA on this. They're giving us a lot of good support. And so we will be working on this on a regular basis to try to bring the uh, overtime costs down while at the same time not affecting the uh, service in any negative way. So with that, I think any questions on Thank the you. Report? Anybody? Yeah, Mitch, a uh, question for Elena and Howard. To what extent is the reduction in overtime, which is a welcome, welcome news, in the 10 budget or the projection for the year result of service reductions? Um, none of our overtime savings is a result, direct result of the service reductions. In fact, one of the things we have to be very careful of is that as we, you know, go through the recent schedule change and the timetable change, that we don't see a spike in overtime um, as, you know, some of the uh, PIC requirements for employees take place. Um, our overtime initiative was not based on, you know, the service reduction. The savings from the service reduction stand independently from the overtime initiative. Now that the, you know, and we'll go through a little shakeout period the next, you know, uh, four to six weeks. Uh, but we're watching carefully that we just we don't have more unscheduled overtime as a result of employees changing tours and, and picks. Yeah. So, so the, Helena, the entire amount of the overtime reduction at the railroad is. Uh, Second. Accounted by factors other than service reduction. That's correct. Right, yes. You. Yeah, and, and and Pat, in our case, it would be largely the same. Uh, I will. There's one slight distinction. When we are say our savings from the reductions are separate, so it's a, the two are completely separate numbers. The one thing that has happened in Metro North is that because of our consist reductions, which we put in in June, our car requirement has gone down. And that has led to how we look at overtime in our MOV department. And in fact, one of the things has changed is that we are not filling as many jobs on the Harlem and Hudson line where we have extra cars. So you don't need, you're not right up against the, uh, your requirement. On the New Haven line, it's different because we struggle every day to make the requirement. So there, there was a secondary benefit, if you will, of those conscious reductions. But uh, in that, that's a little bit of our savings. Great. Thank you. Good. Any other board members? Susan. I just have to say kudos to the MTA staff for properly evaluating an issue and working towards a resolution. And special kudos to the operating agencies who managed to implement this. I'm hoping that we continue to track this on a go forward basis because we don't need it to get out of hand. We need it to continue to ratchet down. Thank you. Jim. I certainly uh, second those those comments. Um, should these be uh, uh, these numbers be reflecting uh, in the uh, operations statements? There is an overtime category. Uh, just just looking at the uh, year to date on Long Island, for instance, uh, showing a, a million a million dollar positive variance. Uh, against uh, forecast, uh, is is that uh, consistent with uh, what we're looking at uh, on the uh, on the slide? Yes, it is. Um, Mark, you want to address Long Island? Sure. Um, of course, there are some timing issues. The pro the projection uh, that Helena referred to, uh, the thirteen million dollar savings. First of all, that's non reimbursable only. Just to be clear, I'm not sure which page you're looking at. Um, and in addition, some of it is, is yeah, um, and, and in addition, uh, that's just one point I would make. Um, and also, of course, some of the, uh, the savings that are projected in, in that um, uh, presentation refer to initiatives that have just started to take effect uh, later in the year. So in earlier in the year, we didn't have the benefit of those actuals coming in better to performance. Um, I would point out, ours worked uh, year to date are 16% uh, better than they had been. I think, Helena, you may have mentioned that. Um, 201,000 hours less overtime work this year through the end of July uh, compared to the same point in 2009. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that's another good indicator of the, of the uh, performance year to date. 
uh, so you, you, just to clarify, the, the 13 million that we're talking about in, in Long Island is not an annualized number, but rather the numbers that we should see at year end. Right, That's compared correct. to correct. That includes the forecast. Jim, did you have? Yeah, the comparison you mentioned is against new year forecast. This is against the 2009 actual. So you're not going to add one in morning to two. Right, now, and I understand that, and I'm just wondered whether there's any level of comparability, and also it brings up a good point about 2009. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, obviously, this is, this has been a major focus of the board and the chairman, and we uh, welcome the uh, report, as Susan said. Um, I think we all understand there's a difference between overtime and unnecessary overtime. Those are two different things. There are always going to be overtime because of the nature of how the railroads operate. The question is how to limit it to the extent necessary to the operation of the railroad and that railroads. And that I think is the focus here, uh, both on the board and at the operating agencies in that regard. So we will continue to focus on that as we go forward. Um, if there's no other comments, we'll go to uh, Long Island Railroad status of operations. Melina? Okay. Um, as we begin, um, I would like to uh, take a moment and point out that um, during the uh, August uh, break, we did use it as an opportunity to take um, a look at the layout of uh, our committee report, and we worked hard to better align the look uh, and feel of the operations report. I think you'll see the differences. Our next goal would be to look at some of the safety reports and see if we can't uh, put them in the same order, make sure we're covering the same material. And then we will be moving on to um, some of the finance reports. And I've had a request for a bigger font in some of the finance <laughs> reports, and we're going to do that as well. Um, so with that, let me um, turn to a, a Long Island Railroad's operations report. <clears throat> As you are all aware, the Long Island Railroad has had a, a challenging couple of months since we last met. Um, a fire at a major switching point just east of Jamaica on August 23rd caused service reductions for a week. Um, and then we had the force of Mother Nature um, following right on the heels of that with the threat of Hurricane Earl on September 2nd, and that resulted in the suspension of East End service on uh, Friday, September 3rd, uh, and that was, the, of course, the beginning of the Labor Day weekend. And then just recently, a tornado ripped through Brooklyn and Queens on September 16th, toppling more than 200, I'm sorry, more than 20 trees along the Long Island Railroad's tracks. And it resulted in a suspension of service between um, Penn and Jamaica throughout the PM rush hours and a suspension of service on the Port Washington branch. Um, in each case, I, I really want to pause for a moment and commend the response of the Long Island Railroad workforce. Despite the layoffs, budget cuts, service reductions, and all those things that, you know, really can depress um, employee morale, uh, we have experienced in the last um, few months, uh, in each and every case, just a tremendous response by our workforce. In every emergency, our employees rose to the occasion, assisting customers and really working around the clock um, to restore service as quickly as possible. The recovery time in each instance, given the complexity of what was involved, um, really is, is um, a comment on that dedication and that professionalism of the workforce. I am going to take um, one moment this morning uh, to thank uh, not only the Long Island Railroad workforce, and, and I do thank them, and I, I've, I've commented to them that we've had this succession of issues and they, at every time they've come forward and met the challenge. Uh, but also I want to just comment on MTA police. Um, uh, and Chief Michael Cohen is here, um, Deputy Chief uh, Kathleen Finneran. You know, you really have an outstanding police force. I have to mention one in particular, a lieutenant who was off uh, duty, uh, Henry Lofel. He actually was riding the train home on September 16th, um, saw what happened in, in Forest Hills with the uh, trees down, got off the train and immediately started helping the emergency services unit from the police department who were equipped with chainsaws. 
and that really um, made all the difference for us in service recovery that evening because, as many of you know, traffic was just jammed everywhere. The entire region on road network was paralyzed. Uh, and we had difficulty getting our crews there, uh, but because the police were already at the scene, they were able to begin. And then police actually helped escort our trucks, knocking on doors of cars to get them to pull over to allow our trucks to uh, proceed to the Forest Hills area. So um, with that, um, I do again want to commend uh, uh, the police workforce as well as the Long Island Railroad workforce. Let me give you a, um, a brief report on the most serious of these recent events um, and in terms of our ongoing operation. Of course, it was the fire at the Hall Tower. Uh, that's a switch and signal um, location. It controls, um, you know, uh, m most of our train movements just to the east as trains come through Jamaica. Um, the technology does date back to the 1900s. Um, it was a, a Model 14. Um, installed around 1913. It is scheduled, and you're going to hear later in today's meeting about our cutover to new microprocessors. So we're, you know, literally two months away from replacing that equipment. Um, we've been um, analyzing the cause of the fire, uh, and we did retain an independent outside consultant, HNTB, uh, and they are still, um, you know, going through an analysis for us. But we do have some, you know, preliminary results of that analysis as well as our own um, system safety team. Um, heavy rains occurred the night before, and I know it's hard to remember all of these weather events we've had, but there was a particularly pounding storm the night before. Um, the area in Jamaica, believe it or not, most, most people don't recognize this, it actually is built on a concrete slab. Um, it's not as though you can just dig all the way, you know, down as far as you want. It's on a concrete slab. That um, compresses the amount of space we have for all of the utilities um, that we need, both the, you know, all the airlines, the uh, cable, conduit, um, even sewer, everything, you know, is very compressed on that slab. And it has historically had a drainage issue um, and one that we work on, you know, uh, to try to make improvements in the drainage. Also, um, what the consultant was able to identify for us is a long period of, you know, salt on the platforms, de-icing uh, materials and, and solvents used on the train equipment actually run off into that area with the poor drainage, resulting in, um, uh, you know, some very harsh conditions for the conduit underground. And on this particular instance, um, we had a third rail cable uh, that we are investigating whether it was a manufacturing defect or um, environmental um, issues that may have caused the cable to degrade. The third, uh, third rail cable um, arced, sent um, uh, electricity to a galvanized steel um, line that is used for um, airlines that move switches. And that heated up and resulted in the adjacent signal cables. Um, it, it resulted in that insulation melting. Um, and at that point, the third rail cable, the third rail power was able to enter the signal cable. It traveled right into the signal cable um, in two locations, right up to the switching tower. And in fact, the employees at the switching tower, you know, saw the equipment heating up, saw smoke, um, and had to uh, work to extinguish the fire with the New York City Fire Department. Um, it, was, it wasn't a blazing fire. There were sparks and smoke condition. Um, but as many of you saw from the extensive media coverage that this event um, did get, uh, there is a, you know, a, a huge... Um, network of wires, over 200 wire, wires uh, that actually are connected to the Model 14 in the switching locations, the Model 14 board. And all of those had to be um, tested, many had to be replaced, uh, and this was a very complicated operation. The Long Island Railroad was able to operate um, that afternoon. We were back with service. 
Um, and I want to commend again Ray's um, staff and uh, uh, the engineering forces as well. They just did a tremendous job establishing three routes for us to operate PM service. Um, you've heard the terminology, I think, from the media coverage. We went to a block and spike where you don't require the switches to move trains. Uh, and we continued that way through the week until we were able to make repairs. Um, with regard to some of the recommendations that are coming out of the consultant's report, which of course we're very focused on now that we have the repairs in place, we're back up to service, we are um, pursuing what do we need to prevent that type of recurrence. Um, we have identified eight other locations where we did um, uh, change out the cable configuration underground um, to try to separate and uh, put more distance between uh, cables. We um, have changed our cable insulation testing program in Jamaica. Uh, we've gone to every three years instead of every five years. Uh, and we are um, going to look very carefully uh, whenever we have work scheduled for Jamaica um, to try to identify uh, what the third rail cable issues may be. There will always be a traction power expert present when we work on the underground configuration now. Um, I do want to point out that you've seen our capital program. One of the major elements in the Long Island Railroad's capital program is the Jamaica Capacity Improvement Project. I always talk about the um, challenges of Jamaica. Um, one of the issues when we do the Capacity Improvement Project will, of course, be um, the ability to rework some of the underground utilities and network of cable and conduit. Um, one of the issues that we'll be eliminating, for example, are the airlines that move switches. So we will continue to update you on um, uh, our progress with regard to Jamaica and in particular um, our, uh, how we implement the recommendations from this investigation. Does anybody have any questions on that aspect? Pat? Yeah. Helena, thanks for that. Can you just speak to the role that Long Island Bus played following the fire? and the important and critical role that Long Island Bus generally plays following a service disruption, whether an act of God or otherwise on the railroad? Um, I am uh, pleased to speak to that. As you know, I was um, head of uh, 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 Long Island Bus um, in uh, 1993 to 1998, and prior to that I had served as the um, chief of staff, um, and I can date back to when I was there. We formed a um, a very good relationship with Long Island Railroad, um, and, and a lot of it actually started with the Herald um, signal project and the Herald cutover, uh, where we provided uh, bus service uh, during that scheduled outage. Um, and it it's, you know, can be difficult to amass that number of buses, and we're going to experience that with the Jamaica cutover, where we will rely on Long Island Bus for that scheduled um, service to replace some bus service, uh, to replace some train service. However, on nights where, um, you know, we had uh, the tornado with trees down um, uh, during the Hall Tower fire and, uh, um, and, and then the events that occur out east, in fact, um, we often turn to bus companies uh, to provide substitute service when train service is not available. The first on our speed dial list is Joe Smith at Long Island Bus uh, because uh, Long Island Bus has the density of service and bus equipment that can support us. Joe will say, you know, I can't give you anything in rush hour, but as his buses come off their peak, they often continue their trip right to where we need them. Um, so between MTA Bus, Long Island Bus, uh, and the private bus companies, we, we tap into them to provide service. Long Island Bus is not only our, our first choice because of their availability, but because also their employees and their dispatchers know our system, they know the geography, they know the directions, uh, and they're a very professional MTA group. So we, we certainly use them during the Hall Tower Fire at specific locations, and you will hear in the presentation this morning um, how we will rely on them during the Jamaica cutover. Sure. So again, both scheduled and unscheduled. Thank you. Anyone else? <coughs> yes, sir. Hello. Uh, I mean, you had mentioned that um, there was a ch there's a change for maintenance for third rail cable as a result of this from five yes. to three years. I just, does any 
does anybody here know or do you know if what's the usual what's the cycle for Metro North? What's the cycle for transit? Yeah. yeah. Um, Ira, generally speaking, our cycle was five years, and in certain high risk areas, we do it every three years, particularly Grand Central. In fact, one of the things when I speak to Bob Lieblong and I will speak to what happened at the, our incident at the Harlem River Lift Bridge, we have expanded our uh, area that we're going to be looking at every and more frequently to the lift bridge as well. In other words, bo both railroads are looking at uh, systems that, that if they fail can cause a shutdown of the entire railroad and that should have a shorter duty cycle. That's I would right. Yes. That's how you're looking at this. Yeah. In fact, and I understand Penn Station, you're dealing with Amtrak, and I don't know what they do. But it would be interesting, not not this <laughs> meeting, but it would be interesting to hear how Amtrak views that, because that's the most important part section of the, of the country for them as well. I don't want to speak for Amtrak, but um, some of our experience has uh, been that they replace on failure. Um, we have... We will, of course, you know, work with them uh, to identify locations that uh, can impact us. Um, and now that they have, uh, you know, substantially more funding, I think you, we're starting to see some more scheduled um, opportunities. Um, we've worked on um, comparing our um, uh, testing protocols and how we define our high intensive areas, and we are on. Um, track to be in the same schedule with our, you know, most um, important and dependent uh, infrastructure with regard to cable testing. And then different cable selections. We're also looking at how we look at it, how we test it, how we use it, what are our protocols. I mean, even, even beyond just third rail cable, I mean, the other systems, I mean, the signal, the signal system itself, parts of the, as parts of the system, they fail, they cause a delay on some trains. Parts of the system fail, and we cause entire shutdown, and I think those should be looked at as, as extremely critical. I mean, Penn Station central control, I don't know if it's ever failed, and I don't know if there's backups or how that, you know, it, you know but that's obviously a critical thing. I'm sure when it was designed, the idea was being this should almost never fail. I think there's certain parts of our system that have to be looked at that way. It, it actually, um, Penn Station Central Command has a uh, full uh, backup system, and we test that backup system. Um, there are times where we have a scheduled, you know, turn on of the backup. Okay, with that, um, I am going to turn to uh, uh, Ray for our operations report. Good morning, everyone. The operating report starts on uh, page number 15. And uh, for our, and I should start out by saying the Long Island Railroad on-time performance goal is 95.1%. Uh, for August, the overall on-time performance was 87.3%. Our uh, August uh, peak on-time performance was 84%, with the AM peak finishing at 885 and the PM peak finishing at 78.9%. Uh, uh, August off-peak on-time uh, on -time performance was 88.7%. And the weekday off-peak finished at uh, 87.3, and the weekend OTP ended at uh, 91.5. During August, 98.8% uh, of the uh, peak trains met the seating standard. 96.7% of scheduled trips were completed, and 461 trains operated more than uh, 15 minutes late. During um, July and August, we had six 100% rush hours. All were in the morning rush hour, so year to date we have uh, 26 100% rush hours for the morning peak and 9 for the PM peak. AM peak car availability was met each day of July and August. And the total fleet uh, MB MDBF goal of 110,000 was exceeded in both June and July, keeping in mind that one month lag that we have. 159,091 for, uh, for June, 134,085 miles for July. And as Alina has already reported on, the most significant event for August was the uh, fire at Hall. Uh, that resulted in 1,463 late trains, uh, late or late or canceled, um, which cost us 7% of our OTP for the month. Uh, moving to safety, uh, year to date, comparing 2009 to this year, our employee reportable accidents are, are, are unchanged. Customer accidents are down 9%. Total number of rail accidents are down 56 percent. 
Overall fire incidents are up uh, 13%. Uh, that completes the operating report, and I'm ready if you have any, any questions. Any questions? Ira? Yeah, there's one in the um, delays of 10 or more. There's an incident, no engineer on train, on a specific train on a Saturday. I'm just curious as to that. I've never seen that before, and I'm just wondering what it just it sounds odd. Yes, we uh, a lot of times we have other engineers that we can move if there's a failure like that. We it was a case of an engineer who was back from serving overseas who uh, did not follow the proper procedure, so uh, that job was not covered. Yeah, and you know, with a with a reduction in overtime means you don't have, I guess, additional availability. Well, we wouldn't in that location anyway, anyway. Okay. right? Because that's not okay. Of course, there's the rules violation. But that's, I mean, we saw a report on that. So yes. How's that coming along? Are there less or more? We, uh, we've we had uh, two since we last spoke. Okay. Um, and this? we've, um, I've met with my uh, counterparts, including Bob uh, from the uh, other areas of the Northeast Corridor, and we've uh, talked about our, our plan forward and uh, mm -hmm. the progress we've been making. Okay. The only other thing I, want, I just want to note that, well, there's two things. The um, If you take a look at the categories of delay for... August, I think there's a mistake in the August numbers because August and year to date are almost the same. Just if someone wants to take a look and if someone made a, I think the other thing is what I, page I, on, I it's this, I'm looking at page 16, 18. I'm sorry, I need glasses. Okay. Page 18. Yeah, the the 2000 the 2009 data. Someone made some. We'll check. Yeah, and it's good. Not not to ever explode this thing, but other miscellaneous seems to be a, a, a large number. It would be good to hear what that, uh, just provide a list at some point, what that, what that encompasses. That'd be, that, that would be good to know. I also want to say I was, I was stuck in this. I was trying to get to Garden City to the public hearing, so I got stuck when the tornadoes hit. I know Helena tried reaching me. I was actually on the E-train underground, which was delayed, but I'll take that up with transit. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to say that when I, got, when I did get to Jamaica, when some of us got to Jamaica, I, I do want to know there was there was police there, there was Long Island staff there. They didn't seem to know exactly what to do because they didn't have any more information than anyone else. There were sufficient announcements. And one thing I do want to know, which I thought was good, is there seemed to be what I call branch fairness. As I waited, there seemed to be an effort to you know send a train down. There, there were two Babylon trains, I, don't, I guess, for whatever reason. But there seemed to be an effort to send trains. Even There was even a Montauk train and even an Oyster Bay train before I got my Hempstead train. So I thought there was... Within the half hour I was there, it seemed to, to go fairly well at Jamaica. So I want to compliment the effort. I think Lauren Road does show a very good effort when there's an outage to, that I find everybody to be committed to restoring service and getting people to where they have to go. So the, the information issue is something I know we're all trying to work on and in providing information passengers. Thank you. Well, that was the point I was going to raise. Obviously, <clears throat> in any of these situations, there are two issues. Number one, preventing the issue in the first place, which is a maintenance issue, which I know they are working on, obviously, and the outcome of what happens once something happens. The second issue is, of course, communication to the customers and um, being able to do that in a forthright and timely basis is essential, especially in a business like we have where there are all different types of people going to all different types of destinations. And um, one of the, you know, I raised again with Helena last week the issue of the reconfiguration of the electronic signs at all of the stations. I think it is imperative that we do whatever we can to make those as timely as possible. Uh, they're there. We've made a lot of investment in putting them there. We should be able to reconfigure them as necessary to put, you know, up to min up to the minute information on the signs because the signs are what many people rely on especially not at Jamaica and Penn Station if you know if I'm at Deer Park and I want to know what's going on I look at the little sign to see what's going on and if that sign is not timely and up-to-date I don't know what's going on in that context and either the customers and the other situations so the reconfiguration of that the reuse of that uh, is essential in, in moving forward because that's the only, in the outlying stations where there are, the, where the number of railroad or police people are significantly less, and rightly so, the only thing people really have to rely on are the signs. 
and um, uh, I do appreciate your comments on that. Um, I actually um, have been very focused on what we can do to make those um, AVPS uh, signs more accurate when we have, um, you know, a, a widespread a change in the train schedule as we did with the uh, Hall Tower uh, fire. Could we list the canceled trains um, in a more speedy way than we were able to do. We did get them up and running by the end of the week with, you know, real accuracy, but at the beginning of the week it was much more difficult and it wasn't as accurate. Um, and we sometimes make a decision on branches that if the information isn't accurate, the, um, the signs will say, um, you know, go to the website. Right. Uh, but which we're going to work is, on which that. Which is good if you happen to have a oh, computer. Right. If you have, exactly. If you, have, if you don't have the equipment... Yeah. You have no you have no information in that in that context. So I we understand, right. but it's something we have to look at and make sure it happens. More timely. Finances and ridership. Oh, I think. Oh, Jim I'm sorry, something. Jim. No, we yeah. Do, just Jim, we no, do that, have that's okay. No, no, that's okay. It's not yeah. fair because. No, they're, they're, we know. We know. We'll get to Metro North. <laughs> we'll get to Metro North. And, uh, uh, go ahead, Jim. I'll take it offline. Uh, uh, okay. No, that's okay. Okay. Financial okay, and ridership. Morning. Um, I believe most of you received the joint memo from Metro North and Long Island Railroad on ridership. I'll start with that. Uh, the Long Island Railroad, we experienced two very strong ridership months in July and August. Uh, I know uh, July, we were up 1.4 percent uh, compared to the same month in 2009. It's the first time we've had year-to-year -year ridership growth in over a year and a half. So that was that was very positive. Uh, August, we were down 0.7 percent. Nevertheless, that was our second best month uh, of the year. Uh, commutation ridership was down 0.9 percent in July, but it was up 0.4 percent in August. Again, a great sign. Commutation is our core market, uh, and it's the first month in 2010 that we saw a positive number in commutation. Uh, ticket sales were up 1% in August, and that also was the first time we've had growth in that area this year. Non-commutation was up 4.2% in July and down 2% in August. Um, however, uh, we estimate that the Hall Tower fire cost us 116,000 rides that week uh, due to the service disruption. So if not for that incident, we actually would have had an increase in non-commutation by 1.6%. Uh, year to date through August, uh, we've carried 54.5 million riders. That's 1.8% uh, less than 2009, but to give you perspective, the last time we met, we had been down 2.5%. So you can see the, the, the trend is, is working in our favor. Um, commutation is down 2.8. Uh, through August, and non-com is basically on budget, slightly down 0.3 percent. Uh, moving to the budget, through July on the revenue side, uh, uh, we've generated $425 million, which is $12 million unfavorable to budget, but all of this variance is due to timing of uh, capital projects. On expense through July, uh, our total expenses were $26 million favorable to the budget. Labor expenses were basically right on target, uh, payroll expenses and, and fringe benefits. Uh, straight time, uh, right on budget. Uh, and as Board Member Blair noted before, overtime uh, versus the mid-year forecast is $1.5 million favorable. Uh, uh, and again, I'll note, echo Board Member Sidora's statement that the forecast assumes all of the initiatives that Helena and, and, and Helena had referred to earlier. So the fact that we're even beating that number is is, is very positive uh, from the budget side. Non-labor expenses were $22 billion favorable. It's uh, primarily uh, the result of the inventory management initiative and some timing of some purchases. Uh, uh, and we have an $8 million favorable variance in contractual costs, again, mostly due to timing of invoices. For the month of July, the fare box operating ratio was 51.4%. Uh, and through uh, year to date through July, it's 45.6%. That concludes the financial report. Any questions? Okay. Capital program. 
Yes, on the capital uh, program report that appears on page 87, um, there's uh, an, uh, highlights of our uh, program. I'm just going to note uh, the wonderful progress we're making on the Atlantic Avenue Viaduct Phase 2A. Um, we continue to do replacement of the columns, and that is going very smoothly. That's an ERA-funded project uh, that we're very, just very pleased with the results of how we're able to replace that steel and keep that project moving. If you have any questions on the capital program, I'd be happy to answer them, but I'm going to keep us moving here. Any questions on capital? Okay, information items. Um, we have a... Um, uh, Strategic Investment Planning Study, um, which is a new format for Long Island Railroad. Um, we're matching, again, the um, agenda of uh, a report that Metro North had done. We did individual reports. They did a consolidated report. We decided we'd go consolidated as well. It's an overview of um, our strategic investments and studies that are ongoing, many of which you've already heard about, but as separate reports. If you have any questions, I'm happy uh, to take you through that. Any questions from any board members? Okay. And then, uh, most importantly, I have to ask you to turn to our uh, fall construction schedule um, in the book, uh, and that gives an overview of an extremely important project for us. That's on page uh, 114, and that is a staff summary on our track work program that includes the Jamaica signal cutover. Uh, and this is an extremely important um, uh, effort by Long Island Railroad to move out of the J Hall and Dutton uh, towers that have existed for about 100 years into a new microprocessor uh, Jamaica Control Center operation. It will result in limited, very limited, extremely limited train service on two weekends. Uh, the weekends of October 23rd and 24th and November 6th and 7th. Um, we are uh, really providing, um, you know, uh, limited service for essential business travel only. Um, there will be three trains per hour to and from Penn. Again, this is just very limited train service while we work on um, this cutover operation uh, through Jamaica. Uh, we are re requesting that, you know, customers will be uh, using the E-Train. Um, there will be no train service from Jamaica to Brooklyn. Uh, buses, many of them Long Island bus, uh, will replace trains at Mineola to Jamaica, uh, Queens Village to Jamaica, uh, and Babylon service uh, will be reduced to hourly. Hempstead, Far Rockaway, Port Jeff, um, all reduced to every two hours. We, this is just, today is just the beginning of a very comprehensive um, public information campaign. Uh, we will be out there telling our customers about these limitations, asking them to make alternative um, travel plans. We will be operating um, the uh, uh, Port Washington service. Um, I have dubbed that North of Jamaica, our North of Jamaica operation. Uh, we'll probably have some extra train service um, as well to accommodate customers. We're asking uh, uh, some of our customers, you know, that if you're traveling for recreational purposes, go to the Port Jeff line. Port um, Washington line. I'm sorry, the Port Washington line, Port Jeff, and, and those branches will be extremely limited, um, again, for a business travel. So you'll see a, a very a comprehensive um, communication plan. We apologize to our customers for the inconvenience, but the benefits of this program um, really is just outstanding for the railroad as we move forward in modernizing our signal system. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. You're going to get, you know, tremendous information about that as we move forward. Any questions on that process? Okay. If not, Metro North. Okay. Howard. Thank you, Thank you Mitch. Um, you will, a couple of points I want to make, and then we'll go right through our agenda. First, we will hear, as you go through reports, very positive uh, results since we last met on both on-time performance and financial results. Um, while it's in the month of outside of August, on September 4th, I want to note we got our seventh 100% uh, on-time day, and again, want to thank all the employees of Metro North for, for that terrific achievement. 
The other thing of note was on September 7th, we opened our new customer service center in, on the main concourse in Grand Central. We relocated it from one of the surrounding office buildings, and so it's another step forward in terms of making customer service much easier uh, for Metro North customers and put it out in the forefront. Um, finally, I want to give a minute of a summary of what happened uh, last Monday at the Harlem River Lift Bridge fire. Um, you may know that the fire started uh, late morning and it halted service throughout the afternoon into and out of Grand Central uh, State Terminal. Um, we had a terrific response, first by our employees as well as by the MTA police and the New York City Fire Department, who basically took a situation that could have become a lot worse and we were able to control it by getting the fire under control uh, relatively quickly. Uh, at the same time, we mounted a, a, an alternative service plan where all the train service was into and out of uh, Yankees East 153rd Street Station with people taking the subway, either the uh, D or the four subway lines, uh, to get up there. Uh, we had very good coordination with New York City Transit. They provided uh, free uh, access on the subway to all Metro North ticket holders. Uh, and I will note that this was the first time we have ever used this station as an emergency terminal. Uh, it worked extremely well. Um, by and large, we could run, we can run our off-peak or weekend service, though we don't want to. We can run it out of there. We obviously cannot run a rush hour uh, to any degree of success from that station. But I also know, too, that when the station was first planned 25 years ago, this was foreseen as one of its functions, uh, and it actually worked out very well. Um, during this incident, we also had a, uh, obviously a huge in, uh, increase in requests for information. Um, we had about a, a 100,000 hits on the website, which is what we encourage people to go to first, as well as uh, about 50 percent increase in phone calls uh, at our, at our uh, telephone information center. Um, basically, in terms of the cause, uh, this was a 60-year-old cable that failed. Uh, it was part of the original 1954 construction of the lift bridge. Um, the bridge has never been rehabilitated uh, since 1954. Um, clearly, what that shows uh, is a couple of things. First, from a short-term perspective, as we talked previously, we were expanding our inspection and maintenance uh, in the, on the bridges uh, of cables of this nature. Uh, secondly, we, did, we do have a project in our capital plan to replace these cables. It's actually almost 100 percent designed, so we will be replacing them. But I think also uh, it points out this is only a replacement of cables. The bridge itself remains uh, a, a uh, 60, 60 years old, uh, and the funding, we just simply have never had the funding necessary to replace this bridge. And when you look at it and you see how critical it is to the whole Metro North operation, as well as it goes up and down, the difficulty we have in, in properly bringing the bridge back down again after river traffic, uh, you realize how critical the need to continue to invest and find money to replace this kind of infrastructure. It's very hard to run a railroad when you have 60-year-old uh, bridges that haven't been rehabilitated that are supposed to go up and down every day. Um, with that, I think maybe we switch into Bob is going to give a little bit more on this and then the operating report. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Well, as Howard said, last Monday we had an event, a fire event. Uh, it took place around 11.30 in the morning. Uh, within 10, 15 minutes, we had a hold on all four tracks, opened up our situation room, and immediately went to work on an alternative service plan. <clears throat> we put that into effect somewhere around 1245, about an hour and 10 minutes after the, or about an hour after the uh, tracks were taken out of service. We were running a Hudson Line service inbound now, uh, down to Yankee Stadium, and then turning it, sending it back up on the Harlem Line and on the New Haven Line. We were bringing trains down, <clears throat> making all local stops, stopping at Woodlawn uh, for a connection to the subway on the, at Woodlawn, and then bring, coming around the Y at Monhaven into Yankee Stadium, and then again turning those trains and sending them back out again. Outbound everything out of GCT, what we did was, <clears throat> via the uh, number four and, and the D, used the subway up to Yankee Stadium and made the transfer there. All in all, uh, that went uh, uh, fairly well. Uh, 1 10 uh, in the afternoon, we brought the fire under control. We started inspecting. We went to work on 2 and 4 first because they were farthest away from the fire. And at 2 15, we were able to restore tracks 2 and 4. Uh, 
which was plenty for an off-peak service. So basically at 2.15 we were back to normal service. Uh, one and three, <clears throat> which was closer to the fire, uh, took a little bit more inspection. That's where the damage was on the cable, on the pier, on the outside of track number three. Uh, it was 3.40 when we restored that. So basically we were, we were good to go for a normal uh, rush hour service. That night we ran temporary cables on the top of the bridge to supplement the, the cables that were damaged. Uh, we worked over the weekend uh, for inspections because there's three other locations uh, on the bridge with the same setup uh, where we had uh, the failure. Uh, to do, we still have to make permanent repairs to the cables on the bridge uh, following up an inspection. And of course the fender uh, system uh, was damaged during the fire. Actually this would have been a non-event had it not been for the sparks and the uh, uh, hot steel that went down onto the fender system and caused the spectacular fire uh, <clears throat> on the wood structure. We'll be bringing in a consultant to take a look at that, do an evaluation, see what repairs are needed. We know we've lost the walkway. I'm hoping that the, uh, the structure itself is salvage, salvageable. Uh, we need to uh, put the marker lights back out there, and we lost a couple of cameras as part of uh, another project. But uh, <clears throat> the NYFD with their fire boats, uh, NYPD, our police, and uh, all the Metro North folks, and especially the, with the Transit Authority, uh, Getting our people up there was uh, it was a it was a good project, good job uh, by all, and uh, we were able to get it back uh, for our evening rush. So that's just a, a recap of what took place. If there's any questions, I'll try to answer them. It's still under investigation, but uh, we know we had a failed uh, installation on one of our cables. These cables actually bring uh, power to the movable portion of the bridge as it goes up and down, <clears throat> makes a contact. When the bridge is closed, it allows for a continuous uh, flow of energy across, but when the bridge co goes up, you have to break that connection. So this was a connection from the circuit breaker house up to the movable portion of the bridge. It was an insulation inside a wooden block uh, that wore and allowed leakage of the current into a bolt that holds the block, and hence uh, there was a failure. So it was a uh, basically a, a short circuit of a power cable. So Any I'll questions? try to answer some questions. Any questions from any board members? No. Nope. Okay. Right ahead. And we will roll into the uh, August operating report. Uh, status of the operation is outlined on page 117 in your agenda book. <clears throat> in August, we operated 98.4 percent, which was above our goal of 97.7. Uh, all categories were above goal for the month of August, and in fact, uh, I believe this was our best August in the history of uh, Metro North. Of uh, the 31 days in August, we did not operate any days below 95 percent. And all but three days were 97% or better. <clears throat> we had a total of 290 trains operated late out of 18,050. 99.8% uh, 98, of our trips were completed. And 99.1% of our trains operated with a full consist. And at the end of August, our year-to-date OTP stands at 98% uh, east of Hudson. Uh, west of Hudson, service operated at 97.1% in August, which is above our goal of 96.3. In August, only 49 trains operated late out of 1,684 scheduled, and 99.6% of the trips were completed. Uh, the MDBF is outlined on page 120 of your agenda. Uh, July, uh, MDBF was 133,718 against a goal of 115,000 and our year-to-date MDBF is 147,618 and that's the operating report. If you have any questions, I'll... Uh... Any questions? If not, finances. Good morning. Metro North's year-to-date July results that begins on page 129 is now measured against the updated 2010 mid-year forecast. And just as a point of reference, I would like to mention that we reflect improved fare box revenues projections of 3% and lower expense projections of another 3% compared to the 2010 adopted budget. This also reflects about 2.5 million of annual reductions in overtime. With an 2.5 is reflected here for a full value of 3 million by the end of this year. These updates were made <clears throat> in response to rebound in ridership and reflect also cost initiatives put in place to make every dollar count and address the MTA's budget deficit of well over $900 million. So far, my report will indicate that we have seen that actual June and July results um, are in line with our estimates. 
So I will keep it brief and just mention that month of July net deficit of 51 million is favorable to the mid-year forecast by 1%, and July year-to-date net deficit of 361 million is favorable to the mid-year plan by 2.8%. Cash deficit of year-to-date July of 200 million is favorable to the mid-year forecast by 28 million. Bob will then also report on ridership and revenues. Good morning. The uh, July ridership report is in your books, uh, starting on page 159 for Metro North. Uh, you were emailed last week the preliminary summary of August 2010 ridership. In July, uh, overall Metro North ridership was up 1.9% compared to last year. Um, commutation was up 1.5%. Non-com was up 27 In August, overall ridership uh, for Metro North was up 3.4%. Uh, that breaks down 2.7% uh, up for commutation, 4.2% for non-com. Year-to-date through August, overall Metro North ridership is now positive versus 09, up Eight tenths of a percent. Commutation just slightly below 09 levels at zero, minus 0 0.2, and non-com is plus 2.4 percent. So, uh, as Mark mentioned earlier, um, similar to what Mark mentioned earlier, Metro had two very good months for all, July and August for ridership. Any questions? Anybody questions? Okay. Obviously, in October. Um, Metro North will have something that Long Island Railroad will not have, and that's playoff games. I understand. <laughs> that's what I've been told. The odds look that's good. what I've been told. <laughs> uh, I just want to make sure I'm up to date on those things. Could be. Capital report. <laughs> good morning. The uh, capital report begins on page 170. Just a couple of very brief highlights. Um, the first of our overhauled F-40s for the West of Hudson service was returned and will be going into service shortly over in New Jersey. That program is progressing well. The second locomotive is scheduled to ship in about a week and a half or so. And um, we are currently in the middle of a uh, drainage improvement project in the, in the lower Bronx around the Mott Haven area where, you, as you know, we've had some, uh, some flooding problems. That program... Pro Excuse me. That project is going very well, and we're about 65% complete with that. We hope to be done with that by the end of the year, and, and hopefully uh, we'll see some improvement in, in that. And that's all. If anybody has any questions. Any questions on capital? If not, safety? Good morning. Uh, beginning with employee injuries found on page 175, I'll be summarizing results through July. Our total employee injuries realized a reduction of 23.8 percent, uh, going from 134 injuries in 2009 to 102 injuries in 2010. Our lost time injuries realized a reduction of 21 percent, going from 71 in 2009 to 56 in 2010. Our lost time and restricted duty frequency index went from 2.16 to 1.86 in 2010, realizing a 13.9 percent reduction. Uh, FRA, re FRA frequency index went from 2.78 in 2009 to 2.35, realizing a 15.5 percent reduction. Our customer injuries, our total customer injuries in 2009 were 128, 2010, they reduced by 11 percent to 114. Injuries per million rides went from 2.83 in 2009 to 2.52 in 2010, also an 11 percent reduction. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Any questions on safety? Okay, information items. Okay, now yes, we have a number of them. Let me try to walk through them quickly. Uh, first, on the uh, second quarter HVAC results, that's in your book. Uh, we, that was good results in terms of uh, heating and air conditioning. Um, we have the strategic investment and planning studies update report, uh, as well as the quarterly inventory report. And let me just ask if there were any questions on either of those two. Any questions on any of those two okay. reports from any board members? Okay. okay. Then the October schedule change uh, is here. We, these are some small changes. We had a major cha change. 
uh, to accommodate construction on the New Haven line in Connecticut at the end of August. These are some small modifications uh, during October. Um, stop and ask if there are any questions on that. Any questions at all? Okay. Okay. Then we have the Grand Central Terminal Retail Development Report. Uh, let me just summarize that. And we also have Nancy Marshall, I see way in the back uh, at MTA Real Estate is with us as well. Um, first, l let me just say that one of the things that Metro North and MTA Real Estate have jointly been working on is continuing the success of Grand Central and pushing to see where we can increase the return to the MTA in terms of net dollars that we're getting from that investment. And so the two parties have been working very diligently over the last year or two on doing two separate things. One is on increasing the revenue, and the second is reducing the costs uh, that we have for operating the terminal through Jones Lang LaSalle. And I want to say that the results have been extremely successful. Uh, it is laid out in the report. Just a couple of highlights is that the uh, net, ex the net uh, cash to the MTA, or the net um, revenue to the MTA has gone up in 2010, is up $1.7 million over 2009. That's up almost $5 million from 2007. And so that's in the vicinity, the last one, of a 30 to 50 percent increase. And so we will keep working with, uh, with real estate. Nancy keeps working with Jones Lang LaSalle, looking at new ways of both making money and where we can save costs and it will be a, a focus for both parties. So let me stop to see if there, anyone has any questions on that report. Any questions on the Grand Central report? You're doing a great job on that regard. Mm, thank the, you. The mix of tenants and yeah. everything is a, is a very, very, very big improvement. Good, yeah, and I, I want to, again, I really want to recognize Nancy and Jeff Rosen Real Estate in terms of that, those efforts, in terms of bringing in the new tenants and keeping it yep. to be a very fresh and vibrant uh, location. Uh, and finally, we just have a, an agreement on, uh, uh, f uh, for, uh, I guess it's for haircutting uh, facilities. I, I always say mobile haircutting. Mobile facility. haircutting, yeah, I call them s oh, salons, but yeah. uh, saloons, I can't get the two straight. <laughs> so at three stations, and we'll see how this works out uh, um, in terms of a customer uh, amenity. Obviously, somebody wants to try it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Any questions? That you need a motion? Can I no. move the hairstyle? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a second? Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, okay. Okay, and that's it for us. Okay, police department. Chief. Uh, good, good morning. Uh, for August, we were up slightly 25 versus 22 crimes last year, mainly due to four robberies in Mount Vernon, three of which were closed out to arrest, and one of those arrest closed out eight cases in Mount Vernon so it was a nice effort by the detectives and the uh, patrol bureau uh, and, and I'd like to thank uh, both railroad presidents both Helena Williams and Howard Parmit for recognizing the efforts of the uh, MTA Police Department uh, and I'd like to commend uh, Chief Finneran, Kathleen Finneran's here for her efforts not only in August but then again in September uh, on, the, on the outages and uh, Chief Connor who could not be here today for his efforts uh, last week uh, during the outage from Metro North Thank you. I just want to, on behalf of the entire board, congratulate and thank the MTA police for all the hard work on these very unexpected situations. It's uh, situations you hope don't occur, but you have to be prepared for them when they do occur, and that's the hardest part. And uh, I only heard tremendous comments from customers on the MTA police in both situations, so I want to thank the police in that regard. Capital Construction, Michael, Eastside Access. Uh, good morning. Uh, just uh, an update at Capital Construction in August. Uh, 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 Bill Goldstein has joined as uh, my deputy, EVP. Um, is that thing in the audience, Bill? Uh, and also we have um, uh, hired a deputy for the East Side Access, uh, Chester E., that has joined us uh, about a couple of weeks ago. He is also a former I think MTA, uh, <clears throat> actually chief engineer at one time. Um, just let me uh, just walk you through quickly on the uh, east side access. Um, uh, the progress right now uh, in Manhattan uh, in underground work is proceeding, um, uh, and we have a little over a thousand feet to go in our uh, uh, TBM uh, uh, mining, and that's moving well. 
um, as well as uh, uh, the work of removing muck from the, the cavern that has been uh, a problem for us for a while, but now is moving quite well, and we expect to reach a balance between what we actually uh, mine and what we can evacuate. Uh, <clears throat> the um, uh, the 50th Street uh, um, uh, uh, demolition of the buildings, uh, the 50th Street, uh, this is a, uh, a location on which we are uh, we're going to have a, a vent plant, uh, <clears throat> is uh, actually proceeding. And um, uh, we, in effect, uh, uh, that's moving well, and we have in place right now, we agreed uh, uh, with DOT and the community uh, regarding uh, uh, the type of work and the restoration for the holiday embargo. Uh, <clears throat> one thing to mention, though, is that uh, in the last uh, two weeks, uh, we are prohibited of doing any blasting uh, in, the, in the tunnels due to the UN uh, uh, session, and we are not allowed to bring any uh, the explosives into Manhattan. So <clears throat> that kind of uh, uh, slowed us a bit down, although I just wanted to mention that we have over 600 people right now working uh, between the, uh, uh, the what is used to be medicine yards and the tunnels. So, so the work is really uh, heating up and is moving uh, okay. <clears throat> the uh, uh, remaining Amtrak design for the Herald uh, uh, C H zero five three. This is a stage one. Uh, was uh, w submitted and um, to Amtrak incorporated all the comments, and uh, we expect final approval by mid October. That would allow us to actually progress our work there uh, and, and, and prosecute it much faster. Um, <clears throat> and uh, since. Uh, in effect, um, I just wanted to mention that the uh, tunnel boring machines uh, for the Queens construction uh, have arrived in the United States, and they are actually in New Jersey, and they're on the way to uh, our facility in Queens. So we'll announce probably next time around the uh, starting of the, uh, of the mining. Uh, <clears throat> in that regard, the contractor is currently working uh, at or slightly ahead of schedule, and we expect that to move forward. This is one of the first... Uh, of this type of work in, in New York that we're doing a soft ground tunneling. Um, and I'm going to try to be succinct with that. So it's all done. Any questions on east side access? For those of us who have been down in the caverns, we understand the importance of muck. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's all you see is muck. And, and that's, but, uh, in the cavern. In the cavern, yes. That's all you see in the cavern. Uh, procurements, Long Island Railroad, and we did hand out... Uh, Page 255 in the book was missing, so we have handed out page 255. Yes, thank you. Um, that's the list of non-competitive -pro non procurements, um, and they total $2.4 million. Uh, we would note that two of them involve a multi-agency. Uh, one is um, New York City and Metro North, uh, and that is for... Um, different uh, supply of parts required that on an as-needed basis for cranes, heaters, and tools. Um, there's another one that is both Long Island Railroad and New York City that involves a um, software support and maintenance of equipment, um, hardware equipment from Penta Corporation. And with that, we ask for a vote on the non-competitive procurement. Motion to approve. Motion Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. And there are no competitive um, and no rat ratifications in this month, this month's package. Okay, Metro North. Okay, we have uh, one joint procurement um, for, uh, requesting approval for seven-month con contract extension for off-site record storage and retention services. That covers a number of the MTA agencies as well as headquarters. Um, as well, we are also requesting for. Uh, Three procurements this month. I'm sorry, four procurements this month. One non-competitive, which is for a uh, the maintenance of our car hoist and body support system that was put in at Harmon Shop, the new facility. And three competitive procurements. One, the one I just mentioned before. One uh, with a, a, ch a contract change with the firm Frontier. They did additional disposal of uh, old and obsolete rolling stock beyond what we originally estimated seven years ago and also to exercise a uh, two-year option for various snow removal contractors throughout the Metro North Territory. And, and second. 
Any questions on any of the procurements? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Michael? Um, we have uh, uh, three procurements um, uh, items totaling $2.113 uh, million, and there are no non-competitive items. Uh, we have, in fact, one competitive item and two ratification. The first item is the modification for scope transfer from a future contract to the East Side Access Medicine Yards contract to demolish a crash wall. Uh, the work involves demolition and removal of a crash wall in an amount of $980,000, and um, the budget associated with the portion will be transferred from the future contract into this. Uh, the second contract is a ratification of the award of an agreement in amount of $291,999 to complete the configuration and installation of equipment and software for the uh, IESS uh, uh, program. And this work will bring the system to operational readiness for the Long Island Railroad MTAPD. Uh, and the third item is the ratification of a modification to the Eastside Actors 50th Street Ventilation Facility in the amount of 841043 for emergency work to address safety and security issues in existing 63rd Street Tunnel Ventilation Building on Roosevelt Island. Any motion, sec? Any questions on any other procurements? All in favor? Aye. If nothing else, we are adjourned until October 25th. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.